May 1999. Several missing person reports have led investigators here to an abandoned bank vault in Snowtown, Australia. Inside the vault were six barrels containing eight bodies and four men implicated in the murders. In 2011, the accounts of these men were captured in a searing thriller called The Snowtown Murders. And this film was inspired by a true story. Welcome to True Crime for Cinephiles. This is Inspired by a True Story, a podcast devoted to keeping artists honest. I'm Aaron Peterson, an accredited film critic for the Hollywood Outsider podcast and website and devoted true crime follower. Joining me today are fellow The Hollywood Outsider film critics and true crime devotees, John Davenport and Amanda Sink. Hey, guys. Uh, happy to be here. Well, sort of happy to be here, depending <laughs> on what the subject matter is going to be. Uh, well, okay. I'm recovering to be here. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hello. Hello, Amanda Sink. Uh, I am not excited to be here, but I'm, I'm here ready to discuss these pretty brutal and vicious crimes. What a heavy lift. Even the film was, let alone the crimes. Man. Right? The oh. the film I thought was bad enough. All right, That's like in the scheme bad of enough, what like you're you seeing, didn't, you didn't like it or just dark enough. Which one? Are you just doing? dark. Okay, just dark. Yeah, there there were some really uh, difficult moments to get through, and then you like do more research on the actual crimes, and it's like, boy, this actually gets worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, overall, I gotta say that I started this movie going, okay, well, this is pretty much a whiskey tango situation, which for uh, for not people who don't speak like I do. Whiskey Tango situations are pretty much like white trash situations, but it went Whiskey Tango Foxtrot really fast and was mm-hmm. really hard to get to. What what the hell does that even mean? What <laughs> Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? What do you even mean? What the fuck? I don't know what you mean. What the fuck? Oh. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Oh. I'm going to slap myself later for that one. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing wow okay all right well let's let's get into it but first uh, just so you know new episodes can be found wherever you listen to podcasts or at the hollywoodoutsider.com you can go to inspired by a true story.com but that's going to take you straight to the hollywood outsider so either way you end up there well, first let me break down inspired by a true story there are two pieces to this podcast the crime itself and the movie or tv series it inspired so we're going to discuss the overall details of the actual crime, then review the film on its own, and then how much of that is actually true and how much was Hollywood magic, a.k.a. exaggeration or outright nonsense. Before we dive into the true details of the crimes and our review and discussion on what the movie used for inspiration, let me summarize the film for those of you that might not have watched it yet. The Snowtown Murders, or Snowtown, as it's often referred to, is a 2011 film from director Justin Kurzel. The Snowtown Murder stars Lucas Pitaway as Jamie Velasicus, a 16-year-old boy who lives with his mother, Elizabeth, and his two brothers, Alex and Nicholas, over in the, you guessed it, Snowtown, Australia region. The family is poor and struggling to make ends meet, not to mention Jamie has been traumatized, sodomized, and abused. And then he meets John Bunting, played by Daniel Henshaw. Now, John is a very charismatic man, and he immediately comes to the rescue when a neighbor of Jamie's is proven to be a pedophile. John becomes a mentor to Jamie of sorts and slowly begins exposing his private life and beliefs to Jamie. John is a bigot and he rages with self-righteousness and eventually begins murdering people with his friends and Jamie that he has deemed pedophiles or rapists. Oftentimes, it's just word of mouth. Jamie merges into this world and comes along for the ride, discovering as he goes just how dark and depraved these crimes truly are including making recordings for the victims' families to imply that they were still alive, using the victims to gain access to their accounts to rob them after they've killed them. The film paints a picture of lost innocence to the hands of a charismatic manipulator, but the true story behind this film paints a far darker picture. 
You guys ready to talk about the overall details of the crime? Oh, yeah. We have we have lots to talk about. Film and true crime fans alike are always debating how true their true crime is. So let's investigate the Snowtown murders. Oof, so dark. May 20th, 1999. The disappearance of Elizabeth Hayden has led South Australian investigators to an abandoned bank vault in Snowtown, Australia. Inside, they find six barrels containing the bodies of eight victims. Police believe these bodies were held in different locations before being moved here in 1999. Two more bodies were found buried in the backyard of John Bunting's home in Adelaide the architect of these murders. All told, three men were convicted of these murders. John Bunting was convicted of 11 murders. Robert Wagner was convicted of 10 murders. Jamie or James Velasquez pleaded guilty to four murders. And Mark Hayden was convicted on five counts of assisting the murders, hiding bodies and such. The trials lasted 12 months, the longest in Australian history. Among the victims were James's half-brother and stepbrother, Troy Yowd and David Johnson, whom he helped murder. Mark Hayden's wife, Elizabeth Hayden, Clinton Trezis, Ray Davies, Suzanne Allen, the only one that they claimed to have died of natural causes, Michael Gardner, Barry Lane, Thomas Trevelyan, Gavin Porter, Fred Books, Gary O'Dwyer. During the police investigation, authorities recovered knives, a shotgun, saws, rope, tape, gloves, pliers, clamps, and even an electronic shock device. John Bunting claimed that he had been beaten and sexually abused as an eight-year-old child by a friend's brother, and therefore grew up with not only a hatred of pedophiles, but gay men as well as anyone he considered weak. The targets of these crimes were seen to fall into these categories by this group, therefore attempting to justify their horrific crimes. Oftentimes, the killers would torture their victims in order to elicit bank information or to establish reasons for their disappearance by fabricating their voice and phone calls. Those are the crimes known as the Snowtown Murders. My God, that's insane. Discuss! (sighs) What we should also add in... I guess in this, I don't know, this is going to make me sound really terrible possibly, but I feel like it's important. I'm glad. I'm glad. I need to look at somebody else besides these people. (laughs) I'm tired of focusing on them. (laughs) A lot of the individuals, or at least some of the individuals, uh, the victims who were murdered were perpetrators of abuse in terms of being a rapist or pedophile. So like, I guess the elephant in the room how do you guys feel or, or where do you stand? You want this recorded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, how do you feel, mm. you know, with with basically bad people being taken out? Well, I mean, that's 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 a little bit of, if you do a little bit further research on some of the some of the victims here. That's well, a little no, bit no, I mis- know. I know that that's like very it doesn't go into the detail of all of how brutal and grotesque the murders were and the things that went into it. But I want to start on the surface level of that question. Uh, Yeah. Some of the victims are perceived to be uh, pedophiles. Other victims were, uh, were gay. And then finally, a lot of, some of the victims were just people who slighted somebody in this group of killers by one way or another. I mean, that's part of the story. Like you sit there and yeah, you but think, you're, okay, you're kinda, well, they're you're kind of avoiding her a direct question. She she was pretty direct on the question. She was like, in, in respect to the ones that were guilty of such mm-hmm. a crime, how do you feel about that? All right. So if we're going to talk about uh, the ones who were guilty of such a crime, yeah, you know what? Let's write them down to hell. Why not? <laughs> Man, I am such a law abiding citizen and whatnot. Uh, you know, I. I studied too much law. Look, I I hate those particular people with more passion than I could even muster. To be perfectly honest, like there, it's hate. It's not disgust. It's not concern. Like I would for a lot of people that have 
mental illness or, or things like that, you know, schizophrenia issues, that sort of thing. Pedophilia is a completely separate incident. Rape is a completely separate incident. And I, I just have no respect for anybody in that situation uh, in terms of the perpetrator. That said, if you start condoning murder, vigilantes is what you get. And vigilantes are never going to get everything right. So at some point, someone innocent will be murdered. So I cannot in good conscience condone any of those acts because the justice system, though it fails so much of the time, is there for a purpose. And I believe those, those situations need to go via the justice system. Otherwise, you will end up with innocent people that are suffering for, for things that they had nothing to do with. And who did, and also who determines that they are guilty? Because a lot of, a lot of these particular cases, John Bunting said that they were pedophiles and whatnot based on rumor and innuendo, not real Mm -hmm. hard evidence. Yeah. I mean, and we'll talk about the movie, you know, next, but, and how everything compares, but I, I definitely, to John's point, yes, there's a lot of information and details that are missing from what you see in the movie to the true crime. And that alters your perception of how you probably feel about some of this. Mm -hmm. To Aaron's point, and to the question that I had asked, am I going to be mad if those people are gone? No, I'm not going to be mad. But to what you're saying, I also don't believe that we should be the judge, jury, and executioner. Yes, we should go through the justice system. That's how it should be. That's how it should work. But then the other side of it is that doesn't work. We were we were actually having this conversation offline about how many mm-hmm. rapists are truly convicted. And it's less than 1% yeah. of rapes have a convicted rapist. So 0.70%. And that's insane when you think about that, especially in relation to other crimes. And the other part of it is in some of these situations, law enforcement was asked to partake and do something about it. And I, I'm by no means am I condoning these murders. So I do want to separate that. But in the, the general scheme of things, I guess there's a part of me and I feel very guilty, I guess, for saying that. But part of me is like, well, if, if, it, if there's cold, hard facts, I'm probably not going to be super upset about that loss. The movie kind of makes this mistake, and I and I know that a lot of us as people make this mistake, where we sit there and we we look at the crimes or the people who were the victims and say, okay, well, uh, two out of the twelve likely really deserved all this, right? And we start getting this whole Dexter esque uh, voyeuristic enjoyment out of the idea that at least two of these people uh, right. out of the twelve were definitely somebody who did something. Uh, to somebody else uh, and probably in whatever degree you want to say it deserves some sort of punishment, right? I don't want to fall into that voyeuristic Dexter enjoyment idea when it comes to real crime. And I want it to be something that's more uh, crime and punishment. You know, you do the crime, you get you, somebody catches you, you go to jail, that whole thing. I want that versus enjoying the fact that somebody's taking it upon themselves especially in particular to these crimes, if we start focusing on just the people who did wrong things, we lose the fact that there are people who got caught up and were murdered for perceived slights. They Being just didn't gay. like them. Being gay. Yeah. You know, all these different things that they, the reasoning behind each murder here, getting lost in the idea of somebody deserved to, to die versus not die is is problematic. Uh, what I'm most disturbed by is that um, there were seven barrels, but eight bodies. They couldn't afford another barrel. Six barrels. Six barrels. So two barrels. Six barrels, but eight bodies. <laughs> hey, man, I'm not I'm not judging. The economy is hard on a lot of people. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not judging that. Uh, there's already too much to judge with these. I was going to say they're living in poverty. It's ama- I'm amazed that they found six barrels. Let's be honest. And if you go look into it, you know, there's plenty of documentaries on it. There's plenty of, of uh, podcasts that dive into this very, very deeply. These are monstrous people. They mm-hmm. just are very, very cold, vicious people. Now, granted, some of that might be, you know, they might attest that, well, that's because 
they felt pretty comfortable in who they were killing. Yeah. Is it really the case though? I mean, murderers, I believe once you begin murdering your conscience, whatever is left of it declines. And, yeah. and I feel like by the time these people came to trial, they were just, they were, they would have murdered anyone for their own. Well-being. Oh yeah. Th- there was definitely sadistic nature to them prior to even getting to the murder, especially bunting out of everybody. Yeah. And, well, and the animal cruelty is like, a, it's, mm-hmm. that is a, another level that shows that you're, you're not out to be this uh, vigilante getting justice. It's you enjoy it. And, right. and bunting was even evaluated by a psychologist and determined that he was a psychopath because of the, the things that he did and how much he enjoyed it. No shit. That, that took a, <laughs> <laughs> how deep was that uh, evaluation? Because, I mean, I feel like it would have been about right? three minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. He's into it. Yep. Get him out of here before he kills me. So the thing I'll say about uh, Bunting is that, or and some of the murders, is they can't even prove that Bunting was that every single one of the murders. It's likely that sometimes his group of people that he had shaped and molded into his followers, more or less, were doing the murders without him, just with his approval or whatnot, so that he can... That'd be like saying Charles Manson was like not that bad because he wasn't there for all of them. Like, oh, no, I'm not saying that he wasn't he You're wasn't the that orchestrator. Bad. You're trying to make no. it all happen. Yeah. You are in, directly involved. He was in- convicted of more murders than anyone, so he's the guy. I'm, just, I'm not saying that he's not a bad person. I'm not saying that he's not that bad. He is terrible. I'm just saying that, it, that his control on his group of people was amazing to the extent of, of how much they put into uh, following him. How do we feel about that? Because honestly, whenever someone says that, I'm like, you're still responsible for your actions. I don't care how deluded you are, you know, unless there's a significant mental illness that you can demonstrate. And I mean that we can actually research and and demonstrate, you know, there's, there's certain, Amanda, you know, there's certain psychosis you can't really, it's very, very hard to diagnose Um, dissociative Mm -hmm. disorders. One of them, you know, it's very, very hard to, uh, Mm -hmm. to break that down. But on the same same token, if you're murdering multiple people, I just say that's you. You're responsible mm-hmm. for this. I mean, that's on you. I, I don't have yeah. a whole lot. Also, of Also, when you when you go to lengths to put a lit like firecracker up someone's urethra, at, at some point, this is no longer just oops, the daisies. I killed someone. Was that one of the things I don't they know. did? I mean, yeah. sounding is a thing. Hang on, sounding John. I am listening to this. <laughs> That's one of the things that I did not hear that this That is story. one of the things that they did. Yeah, it's um so basically one of the one of the individuals who was accused of being a pedophile, they tortured pretty drastically, I would say. And one of the things that they did was they shoved a lit like fire uh, like a sparkler, one of those sparkler things mm-hmm. and shoved it up his urethra. So the tip yep, of your yeah, penis, yeah, yeah. where a catheter mm-hmm. would go, got it, uh-huh. got it, uh-huh. got yeah, it. That's enough. Yep, mm-hmm. that's uh, the description is solid. <laughs> I'll take the firecracker over over the take the neither. Spr- <laughs> take the neither. sparkler. Well, if I had only those two choices and then death, it would definitely be the firecracker before the nope, before just that. Just take me out at that point, honestly. <laughs> You're like, I don't even want to be part of I don't, this. I don't want to see anymore. that. No, I don't want. I'm good. Um. Wow, that's really, really disturbing. Mm. It yep. brings you back to, I mean, and, and a lot of this was based on rumors, unsubstantiated claims. Is it worth that kind of horrific, even if you believe in vigilante? And I think that's a problem with with all of us. And I'm saying us as true crime followers, right? Like we mm-hmm. all listen to true crime constantly. To some degree, I believe that people that listen to true crime have some portion of their soul that is okay with vigilante justice because you hear all these monster stories. So you just want the monsters to stop and police aren't always catching them, right? Isn't that, mm-hmm. I, would, would we all agree on that? I would say that degree? that's fair. Okay. Um, but that's the thing is that you're not always going to be right. So well, yeah, where's this, the line? This specific instance, uh, the guy was 18 years old. It's Frederick Robert Brooks, who's mm-hmm. the son of Jody Elliott, um, who was the sister of Hayden's wife. And 
they basically, Bunting had heard, I don't know, like the details if he heard it through the grapevine or what, but he heard that this guy was touching up young girls and had told others that something had to happen to him. Mm -hmm. So basically Bunting was saying like, oh, if he's going to be out here doing this to women, like we got to we got to take him out um, or to young girls. So they met him at a party because he was accepted. Brooks was accepted into the Air Force cadets Mm -hmm. in Australia and they tortured him in a bathtub. He was handcuffed and thumb cuffed. They put lit cigarettes into his ears and his nostrils. They lit the sparkler that went up his urethra. And they made him do the same thing that they did with others where they had him, you know, talk into their recorder and share like personal information and things like that. It gets even worse, though. I mean, he's the one with the lit cigarettes that were stubbed out in his nose and ears, too, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. They put a syringe. Um, they injected bleach into his testicles through. They had that wired to a variac, which sent electrical impulses through the guy's body. Um, <sighs> and then his toes were crushed by pliers before he choked to death on his own gag. I knew everything but the sparkler. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Very, like very, very brutal and grotesque murders. And And I think that's part of John's point is like, even even if these are like bad people, the lengths to the degree that they went, that Bunting and his team went to, to torture and just completely violate these individuals into nothingness and see them as only objects to harm. Like, I think uh, even as true crime followers, you know, maybe to your to your point, Aaron, about wanting to see that justice and, you know, having and okay with vigilanteism. I think if any of those people or the majority of those people, including myself, were to actually see that occur or truly understand the horrific reality, none of us would really be okay with it. None of us would really do it ourselves, right? So that I think is the line is like, yeah, you could maybe even fantasize about wanting to take out someone who does something very harmful, but going through it or going through with it is is a whole other thing and that to me you know like you're just you have to be very dis disengaged mentally to be able to do that i just need to give myself a full body hug for a little while yeah i felt that way just like after the first 20 minutes of the movie i was like boy i'm gonna grab my dog right now this is like oh yeah i I literally was yelling what the you know what I mean? The worst part is that if you actually go in, and we're not going to go over every victim and everything that happened to them. I mean, there are plenty of other true crime shows that dive deeper into the every detail of the crime. Uh, but just, just know that each victim suffered far worse than anything you saw in that film or anything we've already mm-hmm. talked about. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's insane. And I think a lot of this whole vigilanteism that they claim this pedophilia and and whatnot is 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 akin to you know everybody has that friend or that ex that just lied constantly right like everything they said was a freaking lie and the more they told it the more they believed it and it i believe just based on everything i've read on this case is that these particular people john bunting in particular started to repeat this nonsense in order to convince everyone and himself that what he was doing was justified to justify mm-hmm. his own horrific actions. It's that's all it is. It's just a lie built on a lie, built on a lie. A lot of it. I'm not saying none of these people were guilty of horrific things, but I'm saying it's not his place to determine who's guilty and who's not. Yeah. And you're not God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whether you believe in a God or not, um, you know, that's not, that's not, uh, we at least agree that, It's not up to us to determine that. And also, there was not enough sufficient evidence even presented for any, you know, of these cases to the to the extent of, yeah, that's justifiable. Right. The final victim, David Johnson, who's uh, the kids in this in the movie that we end up following through most of it. The only reason why he is attacked or he's killed is because Bunting doesn't like him. Mm hmm. Yeah, he he basically thought he was um, he had derogatory terms for him, but right. 
he just wanted to get rid of him because he didn't like that. I think the way that it's described is like he thinks that David was thinking he was above everyone else. He was better than them. Right. Because he kept himself clean and like kind of well put together type of thing. He was trying to get out of Snowtown or the general area. Yeah, exactly. And these people are stuck in their poverty and having to, you know, use shopping carts for fun type of thing. You know, that's the environment that these people are in is that they're struggling every single day. So, yeah, it really came down to this guy feels like he's better than us and screw him and we'll take him out. The irony right. with him is he's the only one that actually died in Snowtown. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. That was a weird fact to me. <laughs> an interesting interesting fact. I it's because they were found near Snowtown, right? Yes, yeah. Well, I think they were found in uh, the vault was in yeah. Snowtown, but they weren't actually murdered there. Yeah. It's wild. Everything's wild. And if crazy. you've not listened to the podcast before, just so you understand, you know, we're not just going through every aspect of the crime. We're talking the overall situation with the crime and then the movie and then what it got right and what it got wrong because it's several pieces like I talked about at the beginning. So that's why mm-hmm. we're not going into every single situation and every crime. Which takes me to, are you guys ready to talk about the movie? Yeah, let's talk about the movie. Okay. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> well, this film came out in I have three. 2011. <laughs> specific. Uh, it's the Snowtown Murders, also known as Snowtown. It really just depends on where you're searching for it. You might find it under different titles, but it's based on the true events. 16-year-old Jamie falls in with his mother's new boyfriend and, her, and his crowd of self-appointed neighborhood watchmen, a relationship that leads to a spree of torture and murder. It was directed by Justin Kurzel, and the writers were Sean Grant, Justin Kurzel, and W. Marshall, and stars Lucas Pittaway and Daniel Henshaw. So overall, as a standalone film, without any real knowledge of the case, if if you didn't know about the case beforehand, what are your thoughts on the movie itself? I'm going to leave the floor to Amanda because she needs, uh, she needs a lot of room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. What did you think? Because here's my overall thoughts watching it were mm-hmm. it's intense. It has a very upsetting tone. I believe that the, the score contributes greatly to that. For sure. I feel like there's a little bit too much empathy put into it. I feel like we're, we're, trying to be conditioned to almost empathize with Jamie slash James. And I don't like that because I feel like it's kind of how genuine is that? You know what I mean? I mean, he murdered many people and I feel it's almost dreamlike in terms of it's kind of all over the place. I I don't feel like a real thorough linear connection to the storyline. Yeah, one of the challenges, the biggest the biggest thing for me to overcome is really like the narrative from the movie to the real life situation is so hard to grapple with because they're mm. so different. Like there if you were to watch the movie and never read about any of the information, you would never ever feel like they did anything like too terribly wrong. I mean aside from like killing the dog and stuff. There's Aside a lot of moments. From killing the dog. I'm There's, saying like that's extreme. They like beat why? a dude up in a bathtub and kill him. But I'm like, saying, but 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 in the movie, they're presenting it as though it's all justifiable because oh, yeah, these yeah. people are doing all these terrible things. But there's no there's no other side to the story, right? Like we are getting the single perspective from James. Yeah, not many and so, like, respect not much respect for the victims at all. In the story. No, none. Yeah. So if you just watch the movie, you have a completely different interpretation of what the events were. And I hate so much that at the end of the movie, they try, you know, they tell you kind of where everything landed and how things, you know, turned out for everyone. But that indicates like, oh, we're trying to give you some factual piece of reality. And it's like, what skewed perspective were you really coming from because this entire just like you said Aaron this entire movie was like feeling woeful and sorry and pity for Jamie and and do I feel sorry and pity for Jamie for the things that he endured absolutely like if those things happen to someone could you most people go one of two ways right like they're able to deal with it or they're not able to deal with it and Most people just don't go to that extreme of hurting others. It definitely happens. Abusers abuse. And it's that cyclical, 
you know, process, but to never give us the truth of the other perspectives or even to give us the opportunity to question the validity of these things really, really bothered me. It bothered me as well. And in thinking about it later, it makes me wonder if if the intention of the movie was not just to tell the story of Snowtown murders as a true crime event, but more so put you in the mindset of Jamie throughout the entire thing. Because a lot of times you are you are supposed to be sitting there and watching everything that happens to Jamie because he is the narrator, more or less, of what we're Mm -hmm. getting. And he is certainly a biased narrator. That's why a lot of these crimes, especially the the crimes they start depicting in the beginning, are people that are perceived to be bad, or they really nail the idea that they're pedophiles, they're monsters, they're this, they're that. They've done all these other things as far as the victims are concerned, and it paints John as this hero because John is a savior to Jamie in the beginning of the story. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And and there's so much of that where it's like, this guy is coming in and and there's... And I'm sure what they're trying to help you understand through this, like, I fully understand their intentions, right? So Mm -hmm. you can be molded into Mm -hmm. honoring and uh, participating and contributing to efforts that even in your core you feel are morally wrong... If, if you've endured something incredibly traumatic and tragic, and then someone co- comes along and writes those wrongs for you in some capacity, right? You're going to feel like you owe them, like you have an obligation to them. There's a, a literal change in your brain chemistry when you're around people who are this abusive and narcissistic and, ma- and manipulative to coaxing you into believing that some of these things are okay or permitted mm-hmm. or permissible or whatever words you want to use. So I absolutely understand, and there is validity to that to an extent. But on the other Mm -hmm. hand of that, you have to show that at some point, he was no longer the victim. He was the victimizer. Like, at some point, you have to acknowledge that, like, regardless of how you feel about it, it, it's still murder. Like, it's still happening. But they never portray it as though he makes a choice in any of these situations and and I fully understand that yes there's parts of it that will change but but ultimately you're still making a choice and you made a choice in the beginning and so like it's very complex in in that scenario and I feel like they take all of the complexity away from it in the movie and just say look he was a victim this guy came out and saved him and bunting truly thought that he was a god that was one of the things that I thought was crazy is that He would make them like tell him he was God and like all of been master Mm -hmm. and all these other crazy things. I unless I missed part of the movie because it was a slow, long ass movie. I don't remember him saying, call me master. while I No, there was a if I had subtitles on because, you know, Australian accents. (laughs) (laughs) That was it was really hard to understand, too. That's a good point. Yeah, there was a couple of times. When I put, I put on the subtitles on it, and it just said mumbling because <laughs> they couldn't make out what was uh-huh. being said. I didn't have that in my track, but um, they definitely did say master at one point. Call me master at one point. Oh, I, don't, wow. I don't remember okay. the scene. Okay. Yeah. I must have missed it. Yeah, 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 I don't remember the scene. Okay. Well, I'm glad they put that in there then at least. I mean, I mean as they're telling the story of, of Jamie through his perspective, it's not until the last three murders that we sort of get an idea that he is either A, trying, you know, he's leaning into the idea of trying to stay on John's good side, whether he's afraid of him or he wants his approval or whatever it is. They kind of keep that shady. But it's not until, one, they kill his friend who's the junkie. Two, they kill Verna, so-and-so's uh uh, one of the, one of the guys in the group's girlfriends because she f- he went and told her what happened so they killed her and then three finally when they kill his stepbrother who's the final murder uh that's when it becomes very clear that he is completely complicit to the to everything in this and he has changed over to being one of them so there's there's a lot right. that goes on here as far as the growth of Jamie as a character not Jamie as a person because you know that's a different story but in the as a character in this movie they they definitely want you to sit with him and be in his mindset and that's why i think there's so much trouble here it's because you're dealing with somebody who has so much so many mental health issues because of what 
kind of trauma he's been going through for how many how, how many ever years yeah and i think the movie's trying to do that right i think that's part of the aspect of storytelling they're going for which is right how does someone fall under the spell of someone so monstrous like how how could someone even fall in line with them if they at any point had goodness in them and I, and I think that's what the story's trying to tell. I mean, that's the way that they're trying to tell it. And there's definitely kind of, you know, moving away from the actual facts of the case a bit. But on the same token, in terms of the movie that they are presenting, that aspect works. Mm-hmm. The way that they're showing the, the, the breakdown of, I don't want to say innocence, but the breakdown of what trauma does to innocence and how it carries you through life and how it can change how you see things and how you can feel especially when you're deep in poverty I, i've i've been there and i understand to some degree that element of you're just you, you don't know where to turn right you just you don't know where to turn so you find out something horrible who do you go to because there's a chance you might be killed there is an aspect of that in the real world i i grew up around that aspect so i know that it exists on the same token, is that the situation with this particular group of men I wouldn't, based on everything I've seen outside of the movie, I would say no. But in the movie, the way it's presented, I understand where the characters are coming from to some degree. Yeah. And also, once you realize that they're like stealing their identities to get their pensions and they're stealing their bank accounts, it's like, ah, uh, this isn't really just what you say it's about, guys. It's like true. you have you have ulterior motives mm-hmm. and what you're Speak doing is you're the trying. Recorder. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Speak into the recorder. That shit was dark, um, especially because he has one sent to this to James's mom, basically, mm-hmm. for her son. And I was like, that is that is horrifying to like when you put all of the connections, like the relationship aspects together into one puzzle piece. And you're like, wow, dude, you really did that. You really did that. Very disturbing. In regards to the performances, in particular, Lucas Pittaway as Jamie Velasquez and uh, Daniel Henshaw as John Bunting, I think those two are very well cast. In fact, Daniel Henshaw does a wonderful job as John Bunting. They're Bunting. great. He is, because I can see where Jamie, and I'm speaking in the film, I can see where, as a character, he can become enamored with John and how he handles you know, his situation, how he handles the the creepy photographer across the street and basically wins him over that way. And then also becomes yep. extremely intimidated immediately to him. And he just seems quietly horrific. And I think his performance is, is pretty wonderful as well as Jamie's slow descent into complicitness. Yeah. Both of those, both of those are very strong uh, characters or uh, actors uh, as far as with the story they're portraying Louise Harris as Elizabeth Her- oh, Harvey, yeah. who's Jamie's mom. She broke my heart almost every single time she was on screen because she's just somebody, somebody who's at all stages constantly in a crumble and, uh, and, sh- and just so, so hard to watch, watch her in what she was doing. But yeah, Daniel, I want to see Daniel in more things because what he did in this was amazing. Yeah, they were they were phenomenal. They definitely lived up to what they what the directors wanted, you know, director wanted the characters to exude and how they wanted them to come across to the rest of us. I do think that like we lose a little bit of Elizabeth Harvey's complicitness in some of this too. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so that I feel like is, you know, another gap here. But Luis is phenomenal because her emotional breakdowns had me like just dying inside for her. And it start even just that initial start off where, you know, she's trying to take care of her boys and she's making them breakfast. And she realizes in that moment, like, OK, this this neighbor is done something to my kids and she goes Mm -hmm. over there and starts beating on him and i just thought that that scene Mm -hmm. alone was phenomenal and i was immediately bought into her as a character from that point yeah and i want to say that the director uh justin kurzel he went on the direct uh, assassin's creed fun fact what yeah he's the director of assassin's creed so well (laughs) don't get me started there (laughs) this film was better if it makes you feel any better (laughs) Uh, oh, Creek man. is not a good film. That was but, a horrid film in a very different way. 
great ideas. There's some great ideas in there. It just didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. Everything in the Mm -hmm. past was awesome. Yeah. All right. (laughs) So let's talk about what the movie got right and did it respect the victims. So some of the things that the film got right. So John Bunting did have a rock spider wall, as he called it. Rock spider refers to pedophiles in Australia, apparently. I've never heard that before, but if you say so. And on it, he had pictures of men he deemed worth removing from the planet. And again, it's worth noting, most of that is based on assumptions and rumors. So there's no concrete evidence to that. And Velasquez's mother knew about the murders, like Amanda was talking uh, talking about, and did assist at least one. But she died of cancer quickly after they were arrested. So the movie does paint her very much as an unwitting non-complicit component yeah they they don't give you that indication whatsoever right like this is this is the this is the impact of like things are happening and she's not fully aware of like what's going on and then Mm -hmm. she kind of figures things out and she's this martyr right like she's having meetings getting people together talking about these things and wow let's you know let's find who else around us is bad and you know we'll we'll protect people but i think at some point they remove the part of all of the trauma that she knows her kids went through and the impact that that has on a mom and her probably, you know, she had probably an understanding for John to be like, mm, well, I get it. Thank you for doing it. Because I think she was at the point where she was willing to do it in some points and obviously eventually ended up contributing to one of the murders too. But we don't really get that side of her. We just see her more as like this this martyr and then this victim. Yeah, and I think that's where it- it just surprises me. You're going to tell this story and you're going to almost approach it from the viewpoint of the murderers as opposed to the viewpoint of the victims in any way, shape or form. The, like we talked about earlier, the victims are really given no voice, no real voice. I mean, any voice they have is very minor to, to any effect. It's really just from a murderer's perspective. And in, in one way, I guess that's kind of fascinating to a degree. I mean, what Netflix had that Dahmer series that mm-hmm. kind of uh, right. enraptured the world for a, for a time. So I, I guess in some respects, you know, we, we kind of want to know why people do the things they do, especially in, in, in terms of true crime. Like you murder all these people. Why? Like what made you do this? So we can understand it so we can correct it and we can address it. Or we know when our friends seem like monsters, you know, whatever that the case is. But, the the way that the film approaches it is a very very hard pill to swallow for anyone who empathizes with victims i think and i think that's probably why it makes it so unnerving to watch so uncomfortable to watch yeah absolutely it's it's very much like you said where it all, it's actually almost like we're having this like facade presented to us which is kind of, like you're giving us the half truth and that that's not going to by your audience. I mean, I was bought in as an audience member for the movie until I found out like the realities of things and the things that were left out. So to me, it felt like Mm -hmm. maybe somebody did surface level research and then was like, yeah, let's throw this together type of thing. That's the way I felt about the movie. Well, I mean, again, to my point, we're seeing the story primarily through Jamie's point of view. And at no point is Jamie going to admit to himself that his mother's complicit to all this. Dahmer didn't have to do that. And Dahmer helped us, you know, like they gave us his perspective. But we also had an understanding that, yeah, this guy is terrible. Like, we're not going to make excuses for it. There's a very fine line that you have to walk between showing a point of view and showing the the truth in reality as well like being able to present well, the the gratuitous nature of their contributions and Jamie specifically was left out of that well i would say you know when you're talking about a film i mean and this is something that we probably should debate on most of these pod, these podcast episodes like how much truth is really necessary how much should right. be required in something like this when you're trying to tell a story it doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to make a documentary or a docudrama. They're just presenting the cases. But I think when you have real life, real victims, you should make the effort to give them a, a real voice because otherwise you're just kind of capitalizing on tragedy. And I don't, right. I don't know if that's the right way to approach it. 
I understand what you're saying. And I feel like you still have a responsibility to to society to not misconstrue people into thinking that someone was a victim themselves and not complicit. Like there's there's very much, you know, you have a lot of freedom and flexibility to make the movie however you want and have that present. And I don't want to like control art in that sense. But my personal opinion is if you're going to share something that's based on a true story, you can't change the core facts of the story that make it that story. You know what I mean? Like you're even you're using this you're using the same names. You're not changing anything. So it's like you're trying you are now presenting it to the audience as though this is the truth and reality. And the thing that nails that in the coffin for me is the very end when they try to display the the true facts of like what happened to these people. That's mm-hmm. them saying, here's the situation. Here's what happened. Here's what led to it. Here's what occurred. And also we'll give you the text and tell you, you know, in reality, this is what ended up happening after these events events to these people. So you're trying to present it as though there is truth in all of this. All right. So we know that Jamie's mother was involved uh, to to the degree that she was involved. However, she died long before that she long before she was able to be brought to court and to be proven guilty by a court. That's uh, fair. In, in Australia. So to do does anyone really leave this movie looking like they looking like they they didn't do anything wrong? I would argue no. Nobody leaves this movie. Not not Jamie's mom. She is the closest to leaving the movie without doing anything wrong. But still, she there's an air of complicitness to what she's doing because she's allowing this person to be in her life, John Bunting. So uh, and even Jamie, who we're following through the most of the story, who we are watching his we're watching his trauma on the screen. We're watching his, his mental health spiral out of control on the screen. We're following along with him as he starts becoming a drug addict as well. Like all these things are all happening. He doesn't even leave the story smelling like a bunch of roses either. Everyone is, everyone's a problem in this story. So um, I think the only reason why we're not getting the entirety of, of Elizabeth's story is because she was never brought to court because she died before that, that could happen. That's fair. I just want to say, like, uh, to Amanda's point, that there has to be more truth uh, than the non-truth. Boy, I can't wait to talk about Cocaine Bear. Cause, oh, right. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> just damn. Oh, man. Man, they inspired being the key word in that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like you, it was whispered through a waterfall. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, what the movie got wrong or left out, and was it worth it? Meaning, did it make the movie more entertaining to to leave that out or get it wrong? Initially, the murderers boosted the account. These are just some facts that were left out. Uh, in fact, the entire apprehension of these guys is left out. So I guess I want to ask you before we even move on. Do you, do you feel like it was missing that aspect of it? Or are you okay with the way that they handled the film and did not even show the police catching them what led to the police catching them they really didn't show a whole lot about the murder that led to the police catching them like there's a lot of those things that aren't in the film do you think the film should have had some of that i don't necessarily think it should have uh it would have changed the intention of this movie because the movie which is you know very accurate of what john's been saying through this podcast is very much here's what jamie's experience was how did jamie get to where he was and what was john's contribution to that and right you're watching his trajectory and so again that's where i have some issue because i feel like it's it, we go so far into that realm and not enough onto the other side where he does become super complicit that that gets left out in my opinion but i don't think we need to see them apprehended or you know all of those details because this was to help you understand kind of what can lead to somebody becoming a monster and yes our our experiences and our traumas and all of that can contribute to us losing control or you know triggering schizophrenic episodes because there were there was lots of schizophrenia in here honestly 
and schizophrenia runs hard when um, through genetics, obviously, but also when you have traumatic external factors that can, can trigger it to present itself in light, um, which I think has a lot of contributions to these situations. But we're really looking at what was Jamie's experience, what got him to being open to working with John, and then who is John this real monster? Yeah, I don't. I don't need the cops involved in this story. Uh, we would have to change the entire layout of the story and the entire layout of, of what the intent is, because the intent here is to sit you into this men- mental health problem. Uh, if you have the cops involved, all of a sudden you're bringing a thriller aspect or a whodunit aspect to it, and we don't need that. Okay, fair enough. Well, initially the murders boosted the economy of Snowtown before it eventually became a curse of sorts. Now, the only tourists are those looking for reminders of this very specific horrific tragedy. Yeah, so, yeah, it's sad. Uh, John Bunting's home was demolished by the owner. Makes fair. sense, sure. Uh, one important aspect that the movie kind of gets it, I don't want to say wrong, but definitely kind of lead you astray in a way the murders occurred over a decade not a few short years like it seems and and i think knowing that kind of takes away a little bit of that empathy for jamie for sure yes you know um yeah the calls were far more elaborate than this and on occasion the killers would impersonate their victims Ugh. you know they're trying to get wow. money trying to get money so you know james uh velasquez was uh, not this specifically in an innocent individual. He intentionally participated in some, in many of the crimes, but he did turn witness and testify for the crown. That's the Australian legal system uh, for a decreased sentence. So he turned rat. Good for him. <laughs> okay. Well, what, you know what? Whatever brought closure to the victim's family said, uh, yeah, I guess that works. Now the biggest issue I have with the film is how, we've already talked about how it almost seems to justify certain characters behavior and, and almost say, Hey, it's okay that these people were tortured and and victimized. And I don't like that aspect of it. I know that they're trying to present it from, you know, as basically from the character's perspective, but you know, I can also see where Amanda's coming from. And, And I just feel like you have to have the victim's voice somehow in here. And I don't feel like it's represented very well. That said, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just, I think it's a, it's actually a very, enthralling uh, hard to watch film i just mm-hmm. feel like it's missing some pieces that could have made it great i also think it's a little too long yeah it's what definitely one of those well i think it's a little too long because we are, we're suffering through it just like just like the people on the screen are but the this isn't this is in the category of great movies i never have to see again i will agree with amanda i think it's just too long in general there, right. there's a lot of pieces that plod you can't say right you just said you disagreed with her no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, that's me accepting you're agreeing with her. That's <laughs> what, what kind of sense does that make? Then. I'm, he's like, I think it's long because of, uh, because of stuff we're suffering from it. Well, I think it's long just because it's long and it's not paced well. Oh yeah. Right. What? That didn't make any sense. Okay. Let me rephrase it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Works better. All right. Fair enough. What would you have done differently if you made this movie based on the Snowtown murders? What would you have done differently? Do you guys have a pitch or, or a certain way you would have taken the film? Yeah, I would have made it accurate. Well, I have a different idea as to how I would have taken it, which was uh, which would be to follow David as opposed to follow, following um, Jamie around. Follow David and make it more like a Jaws kind of feel to it. You know, a thriller aspect. Really suck you into the story of what the hell is going on and how is it happening. So, obviously, David is... Uh, is adjacent enough that he can notice that there's something weird in this town going on as all these people end up getting murdered. And then we end the movie by him being tricked into going to go take a look at this computer. And he Uh comes to, comes to the realization that he's been around the people doing the murders this entire time. Interesting. That is. I like that. I Mm -hmm. I like that idea, except for the part where you, you watched Jaws and didn't know what the fuck was going on? I mean... Well, okay. Like, <laughs> oh, you don't see the monster for... I mean, the point is, you don't see... Like, Jaws and Alien, you don't see the monster for quite a while. I was quite tipped off in the opening minutes where she's like, fuck, shark! And then, you know, she's bobbing in and out of the surf. All right. Maybe <laughs> maybe I used the wrong words for what my thought was, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's 
funny. <laughs> Fuck shark. Um, <laughs> I uh, what I would have done differently. I I personally am much more interested in how they caught them because I've seen uh, a lot of films in, in terms of how did the monster become the monster. I've seen that. I I just always love watching police capture criminals like this. And I would have liked to have seen both sides. Uh, so I would have, and also I definitely would have given the characters that are the victims more, more of a voice in this. At, at the very least, the victims needed more of a voice in this. That would have really, really helped me. Even if you're still showcasing it from the perspective of Jamie and, and John or James and John, you know, whatever you want to go call them. Even if I still think you needed that, you needed that voice. Yep. Okay. Well, that's it for Snowtown. Any final words on the film, the crimes? Do you want those two hours back? So, do you, did you have to shower after this thing? What? I I um I don't ever want to sit down and watch this again. <laughs> I don't know about getting those two hours back because those are two very hard hours. So I'm just going to put that in my uh my hard hour bank that um that I guess everyone sort of has to have in their life. I'm going to put that in that category. I think, I don't know, I think that this was graphic, uh, but not to the extent that it was doing it just to be sadistic or, um, you know, like a lot of a lot of horror movies do some things like this and it's really graphic and gratuitous or, you know, there's rape scenes and things like that for women. Um, so it's not like we're not used to seeing these things on screen, but I at least have an, a, a more of an appreciation that they, anytime that they presented the violence in any capacity, it had a reason for it. Um, so I would not discourage anyone to watch it. I would just want them to understand that like before you make up your mind and feelings on the situation, either before or after the movie, like at least learn more about the the real situations to help you understand that these people weren't as much of a martyr as the movie makes them seem. Yeah. They weren't John Wick. You know what I mean? <laughs> they weren't Dexter. Yeah. Right. Or Dexter. Uh, yeah. Nobody ended up a lumberjack either. These guys went to prison. So <laughs> where they belong. I'm a lumberjack. Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it. So if you enjoyed this podcast inspired by a true story, please share the show on your social media outlets. Uh, that really helps us grow and give us a review in your favorite podcast app, whatever it is, Apple podcasts or Google podcasts, or Spotify, whatever. Just please give us a review. You are our best source of promotion. So tell your true crime maniac friends about it. We've all got them because uh, we're the ones listening too. Yep. And don't forget that you can hear episodes early by supporting our show at patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. And if you have thoughts on this case, the film, our show, or even a suggestion for a future episode, you can email us at inspired at the Hollywood Outsider dot com or you can leave us a voicemail at 818-814-6246. As fans, we all deserve to know how true our true crime actually is. So thank you again for listening to Inspired by a True Story. Now let's go keep those artists honest. <laughs>